Hi everyone, welcome back. Today I'm doing something completely different. I have been wanting to give you a more broader understanding of the tarot. So today I am going to share my favourite Fool's Journey story with you. And hopefully it can bring you some more understanding in regards to the major Arcana cards. So let's get started with the storytelling. Okay, now the fool starts out with his worldly possessions. In one small pack, the fool travels, not knowing where he goes. So filled with visions, questions, wonder and excitement, that he doesn't see the cliff he is likely to fall over. At his heels, a small dog barks to warn him of possible misstep. We wonder if the fool will learn to pay attention to where he's going before it's too late. Travelling on his way, the fool first encounters a magician, skillful, self-confident, powerful, with an infinite halo floating above his head. The fool, mesmerised, hands over his bundled pack and stick to the magician, raising his wand to heaven, pointing his finger to the earth. The magician calls on all powers. Magically, the cloth of the pack upholds upon the table, revealing its contents. To the fool's eye, it is as if the magician had created the future with a word. All the directions he can take are laid out before him. With these tools, the fool can create anything make anything of his life. The cool, airy sword of intellect and communication, the fiery wand of passions and ambitions, the overflowing chalice of love and emotions, the solid pentacle of work, possessions and body. We can only wonder if the magician created the tools or if they were already in the pack. Continuing his journey, the fool comes upon a beautiful and mysterious veiled lady a thrown between two pillars and illuminated by the moon. She is the opposite of the magician. Still, where he was in motion, sitting while he stood, sensing that she is a great seer, the fool lays out his sword, chalice, staff, and pentacle before her. The magician showed me these, but there are so many things I could do with them, I can't decide. The high priestess doesn't speak. Instead, the words come to him, not from the outside, but from within. What do your instincts tell you? The fool reflects on that and understands what he should do. Decision made, he rises to leave, thanking her. She replies, We'll meet again when you're ready to travel the most secret path of all. Knowing what he will create with his tools, the fool strides forward, impatient to make his future a reality. This is when he comes upon the empress. Her hair, gold as wheat, Wearing a crown of stars, she rests back on her throne, surrounded by an abundant, lush garden. Kneeling, the fool tells his story to her. Smiling a motherly smile, she gently gives him this advice. Like newly planted grain, or a newborn baby, a new life, a new relationship, 
A new creation is fragile. It requires patience and nurturing. It needs love and attention. Only this will bring it to fruition. Understanding at last that this is his creation and it will take time to develop, the fool thanks the empress as he continues on his way. He wonders if she is pregnant. The fool was given choices by the magician and decided on one with the high priestess. He learnt to develop it thanks to the empress. Now he must find a way to manage it. He approaches a great emperor seated on a stone throne. The fool is amazed by the way the emperor is instantly ob obeyed and how well his empire is run. Respectfully, he asks the emperor, how is it that you do this? The emperor answers, strong will and a solid foundation of laws and order. It's all very well to be imaginative, creative, instinctual, patient, but to control one must be alert, brave and aggressive. Ready now to lead and direct rather than be led, the fool heads out with new purpose. Having created a solid foundation on which to build his future, the fool is struck with a sudden fear. In a paddock, he heads into a temple where he finds the Hierophant, a wise and holy man. The fool tells the Hierophant his fears and asks for guidance. The Hierophant says, either give up what which you fear to lose, so it no longer holds any power over you, or consider what you will still have if your fear comes to pass. If you did lose all you've built, you would still keep the experience and knowledge that you've gained up until this point. Also, if your community has traditions that you all share, then you will never lose that even if circumstances force you to part. You can even pass such traditions onto your children and their children, connecting them with past generations. Hearing this, the fool feels his heart ease and he takes a moment to thank the good Hierophant most profoundly, stepping out of the sanctuary he makes his way to meet his friends. The fool comes to a crossroad, knowing exactly where he wants to go and what he wants to do. A flowering tree marks the path he wants to take, the one he's been planning on taking. But standing before a fruit tree, Marking the other path is a woman. The fool has met and had relationships with women before, some far more beautiful and alluring, but she is different. Seeing her, he feels as though he's just been shot in the heart with Cupid's arrow. It is clear that she feels the same about him. It is as if an angel above had introduced their souls to each other. Though it was his plan to follow the path of the flowering tree, the fool knows he dare not leave her behind like the fruit tree. She will fulfil him. She is his future. He chooses her and together they head down a whole new road. The fool is close to completing what he set out to create long ago. But there's no more forward momentum. He feels like he is fighting just to stay where he is. Walking along the shore, it is here that he comes across a charioteer standing in his gold and silver chariot, his black and white steeds at rest. The fool remarks, I feel unable to move forward. What should I do? The charioteer says, first you must armour yourself. Next you must focus on your goals. Where do you mean to go? What do you mean to do? Your steeds keep the wheels turning, but it is your control and direction of them that gets them to their destination. The fool asks, what if someone or something gets in your way? The charioteer replies, you run them down. Your aim is victory, and to be victorious, you must have unwavering confidence in your cause. 
He thanks the warrior, but before he leaves, the warrior says to the fool, One thing more you should keep in mind, he says. Victory is not the end. It is the beginning. Remember that before you decide to enter into any contest. The fool victorious over his enemies is feeling arrogant, powerful and vengeful. It is in the state that he comes across a maiden struggling with a lion, running to help. He arrives in time to see her gently but firmly. Shut the lion's mouth. In fact, the beast, which seems so wild and fierce, is now completely at her command. Amazed, the fool asks her, How did you do that? She answers, I asked the lion to do it, and it did it. The fool asked, Why did it want to obey? At that moment, the maiden meets the fool's eyes. He sees in her a warm gentleness and heart so great that its generosity seems as infinite as its willingness to understand. And that is when the fool understands exactly why the lion did her bidding. He wanted to connect to that higher energy. So too, she adds, are our passions. Let them run wild and they will do damage. But we can, with gentle fortitude, check and direct those passions. In doing so, we can get so much more out of them and yet still sate them. His rage quieted now, the enlightened fool walks away knowing that it wasn't only the lion that was tamed that day by the maiden. After a long and busy lifetime, building, creating, loving, hating, fighting, compromising, falling and succeeding, the fool feels a profound need to retreat. Every night at dusk, he heads out alone, travelling across the bare landscape. He carries only a staff and a lantern. It is during these restless walks from dusk till dawn that his lantern illuminates animals, insects, flowers and plants that only appear by moon or starlight. As these secret corners of the world are explored by him, he feels that he is also illuminated hidden areas of his mind. In a way, he has become the fool again, as in the beginning he goes wherever inspiration leads him. The hermit's staff learns out before him now, not behind, and it carries a lantern, not a pack. The hermit is like the lantern, illuminated from within by all he is, capable of penetrating the darkness. From out of hiding comes the fool into the sunlight, as if being pulled up from some low dark point on a wheel. It is time for a change. Staff in hand, expecting nothing from the world, then things seem to happen to him, good things. Wandering by a water, will a woman offers him a drink in a golden chalice and urges him to keep the cup. As he wanders, he stops to watch a young man swinging a sword. When he expresses his admiration of the weapon, the young man insists that he take it. When he comes upon a rich merchant singing, sitting in a wagon, the man hands him a bag of money. It is as if everything good that he had ever did in his life is being paid back to him threefold. All luck is on his side this day and is his. The fool looking for a new path sits uncertain at the crossroads. He notices a blind, wise woman listening to two brothers arguing over an inheritance. They have come to her for judgment. One brother has the whole inheritance. The other has nothing. The woman listens, then awards half of the rich brother's inheritance to the poor brother. You were fair, the fool remarks to the woman. Yes, I was, she answers. With only half the inheritance, the rich one will stop being so wasteful and the poor one will have as much as he needs. 
The fool realizes that he has spent his life achieving worldly ambitions while leaving his spiritual self to starve. It's no wonder that he feels unbalanced. Thanking the woman, he heads out to restore equi equilibrium to his inner scale. The fool settles beneath a tree, intent on finding his spiritual self. There he stays for nine days without eating, barely moving. On the ninth day, with no conscious thought of why, he climbs the tree and dangles from a branch upside down like a child. For a moment, he surrenders all that he, he is, wants, knows or cares about. Coins fall from his pocket and he gazes down on them. He sees them not as money but only round bits of metal. He feels that his perspective of the world has completely changed. That This inverted position has allowed him between the physical and the spiritual world. Timeless as this is, a moment of clarity. He realises that it will not last. Very soon he must right himself. But when he does, things will be different. He will have to act on what he's learned. Leaving the tree from where he hung, the fool moves through a, a fellow field. The air is cold and wintry, the trees bare. Before him he sees a skeleton in black armour mounted on a white horse. He recognises it as death. As it stops before him, he asks, Have I died? Death answers, Yes, in a way. You sacrificed your old world, your old self. Both are gone, dead. Death replies, mourning is natural and you must deal with your loss before you can accept anything new. Keep in mind that old leaves must wither and fly away from a tree's branches, leaving them bare before new green leaves can appear. As death rides away, he understands how all great transformations start by removing everything so that something new has room to grow. The fool begins to wonder if he will finally find the new spirituality he's after. It occurs to him that so far he's been dealing with opposites. It is at this point that he continues upon a winged figure standing with one foot in a brook, the other on a rock. The fool sees that the angel was mixing water and fire, blending them together into a completely different substance. How can you mix fire and water? The fool finally whispers. The angel answers, you must have the right vessel and use the right proportions. The fool asks, can this be done with all opposites? Indeed, the angel replies, any opposites, fire and water, Man and woman can be made into a unified third. It is only a lack of will and a disbelief in the possibility that keeps opposites opposite. The fool begins to understand that he is the one who is keeping his universe at odds and material world and spiritual world separate. In him, the two could merge. The fool comes to the foot of the mountain where a creative creature, half goat, half god, reigns. At his hooves, naked people engage in every indulgent imaginable, sex, drugs, food, drink. The closer the fool gets, the more he feels his own desires rising in him. I have given up all such desires, he yells at the devil. He is sure that this is a test or new spirituality where he must prove that the temptation of the material world cannot sway him. The devil responds, all I am doing is bringing out what is already in you. Such feelings are nothing to fear, nothing to be ashamed of, or even to avoid. They are even useful to helping you in your quest for spirituality, though many try to pretend otherwise. The fool says, you say that even though these people are clearly enslaved to the material world. 
The devil replies, take another look. The fool looks and realises that the chain collars are wide enough for them to easily slip off over their heads. They can be free if they wish to be. The devil says, as he gestures upwards, downwards and to the peak of the mountain, others who have used these same impulses to climb the highest heights, if they had denied their desires, they'd never have gotten there. On hearing this, the fool sees that he has mistaken the devil. This is not a creature of evil, as he thought, but of great power, the lowest and the highest, both of beast and God. It is the key to freedom and transcending. As the fool leaves the devil, he comes upon a tower. The fool helped build this tower back when the most important thing to him was making his mark on the world. Inside the tower at the top, arrogant men live, convinced of their rightness. Seeing the tower again was like seeing himself back in the time when he thought he was superior, when in fact he is no such thing. To his astonishment, a bolt of lightning strikes the tower, sending its residents leaping out. In a moment, it is over. The tower is rubble, only rocks remaining. Shaken to the core, the fool experiences profound fear and disbelief. Here and now, he has done what was hardest. He destroyed the lies of his life. What's left are the foundations of truth. And not this, he can rebuild himself. Where the tower once stood, the fool sits on the cold stones and glances up at the night sky, wishing for some kind of guidance. That is when he notices a beautiful girl with two water urns kneeling by a pool of water, illuminated with reflected starlight. She empties the urns, one into the pool, one onto the thirsty ground. What are you doing? he asks her. She looks up at him. I am refilling this pool so that those who are thirsty may drink. And I am also watering the earth so that more fruit trees will grow to feed those who are hungry. Come sate your hunger and quench your thirst. The fool eats some fruit from the tree, then kneels by her and drinks from the pool. Both help to heal his wounded heart. Looking up at the stars, the girl says, if you keep one in sight, it can guide you to your destination, no matter how far away it is. Follow your star and have hope. For the first time, B has a guiding light to show him the way. Distance as it is, it restores his faith. Following the star, the fool travels through the night. The full moon rises, illuminating for him a watery path. He passes under the moon between two ancient pillars. When he was in the presence of the high priestess, he saw hints of this dark land through the sheer veil draped behind her throne. As he hung from the tree, he felt himself between the physical world and this one. Here are the mis mysteries he sought the darkest mysteries, one that have to do with the most primal and ancient powers. The path the fool was walking is now a river. He stands hip deep in the water. The fool realises he has only two choices. He can lose himself in this illusion or he can get into the boat and trust himself to the river and the moon. The powers of the unconscious will at least take him somewhere. As the water sweeps him away, moonlight shows his path and he feels the high priestess's approving eyes. The fool wakes at dawn to find that the river has deposited him in a serene pool. The child's laughter attracts his attention and he sees a little boy on a small white pony in the garden. Come, says the little boy, leaping off the pony. Come see. 
The child proceeds to take the fool's hand and asks questions of the fool. Simply but profound ones like, why is the sky blue? At one point, the fool stops, blinking up at the sun, so large and golden overhead, and he finds himself smiling wider and brighter than he has in a very long time. This is the first time that he has been simply and purely happy. His mind feels illuminated, his soul light, and it's all thanks to this child with his simple questions, games and songs. Who are you? The fool asks the child at last. The child smiles at this and says, I'm the new you. And as the world, words fill the fool with warmth and energy, he comes to realise that this garden, the sun above, the child, all exists within him. He has just met his own inner light. As the fool leaves the garden, he feels that he is near the end of his journey. He gazes up and sees above him a fiery angel, beautiful and terrible. The angelic figure confirms you have only one last step on your journey. You cannot take that step until you lay your past to rest. The fool responds, lay it to rest? I thought I'd left it behind, all of it. The angel observes, there is no way to leave the past behind. Each step wears down the shoes just a bit and so shapes the next step you take and the next and the next. Your past is always under your feet. You cannot hide from it, run from it or rid yourself of it. You can face it and come to terms with it. Are you willing to do that? The angel hands the fool a small trumpet. The fool knows that there are memories he has a hard time looking back on as they make him feel guilty, ashamed or angry. He blows the trumpet. The earth cracks open under the fool's feet and the spirits of his past selves rise up. They were him once upon a time, but not now. Even as he realises this, he finds himself forgiving those past selves and in turn that they forgive him for ignoring the lessons they had to teach him. As he reaches an understanding with them, they start to rise up and float away, vanishing into the sky. He is free of ill feelings, reborn and living in the present. The fool turns to take that final step on his final path and finds that he is right back where he started, at the edge of the same cliff he almost stepped over when he was young and foolish. Now he sees that while he thought he could separate body and mind in the end, it is all about the self, mind, body, past, future, the individual and the world, all one, including the fool and the mystic who are both doorways to the secret of the universe. With a knowing smile, the fool takes that final step right off the cliff and soars higher and higher until the whole of the world is his to see. There he dances, surrounded by the stars, at one with the universe, ending in a sense where he began, beginning again at the end. The world turns and the fool's journey is complete. I hope you enjoyed the fool's journey. I hope it gave you some kind of understanding towards the major arcana and what it is telling you. I believe it's a lovely story to tell and I just really wanted to share it with my viewers. Love and light.